Okay, we are recording. We are live. Uh, let me get the presentation pulled up. Whoa, what happened there? The presentation pulled up. Okay, there we go. That's what I was after. Welcome back to Steel Design. Um, uh, it's been a little while since we met in person because actually it's been a week because we had class on um, uh, we had class on on Wednesday and then Friday we had our break. Monday you had the second exam. Uh, Monday you had the second exam, uh, and then you know we're coming back today. The exam's not graded yet. Uh, we I've got advising appointments throughout the week, so like I'd like to get it graded by Friday, but if I'm being honest, it will probably be graded and returned on Monday. Um, I glanced through it. I didn't see anything that stuck out um, as you know, anything bad, and and hopefully um, I think you saw this exam wasn't too terribly difficult. Um, the bolted and welded connection exam is usually pretty straightforward. Um, so, uh, but yeah, I'll, I'll get that graded on Monday. One thing I will say though, is that we are probably going to start having regular homework submissions between now and the end, because we have two topics left, which are columns and beams, which speaking of, I'm going to grab my little, uh, my column, uh, or my, my, my rubber I beam prop. Cause I will probably use that today. Um, but we're probably going to start having regular homework assignments from now till the end. Like you have a homework assignment today and you'll probably have one uh, every day from here on out. Um, the, uh, just like before, they're not uh, designed to be particularly long. And I think these, uh, is particularly the column assignments, aren't going to be too challenging. This first one's a little unique because it involves some Excel, but um, most of this is uh, pretty straightforward stuff. What we're going to be talking about today um, is the concepts that you kind of need to know about columns. We're not going to be talking about all the concepts because there's kind of a, it's today's kind of a lecture heavy uh, discussion, um, but uh, it's kind of necessary to set the stage for what we do with columns. What we do starting now and for the rest of the semester, we start diving into kind of a, a different topic. Like everything from here on out is going to feel a little different than it did. Uh, in the past because the, the name of the game moving forward is stability. Um, columns and beams, uh, unlike everything we've been uh, talking about so far, uh, experience compression. And things in compression like to buckle. And so uh, buckling is going to be kind of the, the name of the game of what we're going to be talking about for, for a little while. Um, so the, the, the process and the design is going to be a little different. We're going to rely a lot more heavily on design aids just because the math is, a, is, is not as straightforward as it is with something like a tension member. Um, and so we kind of have to set the stage. The only other thing I think is worth mentioning uh, just in terms of logistics is I, I'll go ahead and say I get my second shot tomorrow, um, my second uh, uh, COVID vaccine. And uh, from what I understand, that second one could be kind of rough. Uh, my plan is to be here live tomorrow unless I'm just feeling like a train hit me. Uh, and if that's the case, I'll um, record a video in advance or something. Uh, I might try and record one today or, or, or something. I just wanted to give you a heads up on that. But my plan is to be here. I just wanted to uh, put that out there so that you all are aware. Okay, uh, any questions before we jump into uh, column land? Okay, all right, let's talk about columns. Now, a little bit of a warning um, uh, moving forward, uh, oh, do that. Where's my, why isn't it advancing the slides? Okay, we'll do that. Uh, a little bit of a warning. We have some calculus approaching um, today. Um, we need to talk about elastic buckling and we kind of need to derive the equation together. Um, and we need to, un and we need to do that because we need to understand why it doesn't work. Um, we're going to be deriving the elastic buckling expression for a simply supported column and there's going to be some problems with it that we're going to have to handle if we want to deal with real column uh, behavior. So we're going to talk about the derivation and this is these notes are sort of about the lecture as a whole today. We're going to talk about real behavior uh, versus ideal behavior. This derivation assumes ideal behavior and there are two real big problems with uh, 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 this theory of elastic buckling, and that's the concept of residual stresses and geometric imperfections. And so we'll talk about that later. Um, uh, but I also, but but to set the stage, I think it's it's important that we we go through some of the math. So warning, there is going to be some calculus approaching, and 
to, to be crystal clear, I'm not going to make you do this calculus on a homework or on an exam. That's not what this is about. This is more just about you understanding what's going on here. So just, just, you know, just so that we have that uh, clear. So let's talk about the theory of elastic buckling. Um, sometimes it's called elastic buckling. Sometimes it's called Euler buckling. Um, after you know Leonard Euler, who derived this back in the 1700s, this is not a new concept by any stretch of the imagination. This this theory has been around for a while. Um, and what we're going to find is that the elastic buckling terms by themselves are not good enough. They are useful, but they're not enough. Um, but let's let's you know uh, walk before we run. And let's talk about elastic buckling. So what I want to start off with is a pretty basic case. I want to talk about a simply supported column subjected to an axial load. So I'm taking a column and I'm compressing it with a load P. So, you know, the, the reaction on the bottom is going to be P, so it's being compressed with P on both ends. And my goal is to determine P and the associated stress when buckling occurs. And so if you look here on my webcam, so here's, you know, my little prop. I have a column. Let's take that column. Let's apply a compressive load and boom, it buckles. Okay. And if you ever do this, like if you have like a, a yardstick or, you know, something that you can do this, one of the things that um, is characteristic with buckling is that it is a sudden loss in stiffness. Like you load, load, and then boom, it goes. Um, and that's particularly true, you know, if you have like a, uh, uh, like a yardstick or something like that, you can even try it yourself and you'll see, like here I am, I'm trying to keep that load in compression and then there's a point when it just sort of gives up and then you get this sudden loss in stiffness and you get this sudden uh, lateral translation. And that's, that's really what buckling is. If you want a, a scientific definition for buckling, it's a sudden loss in, in uh, geometric stiffness that's typically due to loads uh, in compression. Now, um, what we're going to do uh, is we're going to uh, look at this from a, a mathematical perspective. We're going to see if we can uh, look at this buckled shape. We're going to see that it sort of, it basically forms a sinusoidal shape when buckled, and that comes from the math. Uh, but that's sort of what, what the column looks like before and after. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to break out the secret weapon of structural engineering, which is the samurai sword or a lightsaber if you're a sci-fi fan. We're going to cut a section, and we're going to look at the internal moments uh, and forces inside that section. If I cut a section, uh, I'm gonna. I'm assuming I'm gonna see not just an axial load, but a bending moment as well. And that bending moment, you know, remember from uh, from uh, structural analysis, if you cut a section, you know, you can get axial shear uh, and moment because of the nature of the load uh, and the the nature of the assumptions. We're really not having to deal too much with those uh, internal shear deformations, but we can get flexural deformations, obviously, because the column is but it's bending. You know, it's 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 you know bending like this. So. Um, uh, give me one sec. Uh, does progression of buckling occur over time or when the load is applied to the beam? So a couple things. One, be careful on your terminology because beams and columns are, are not the same thing. Make sure, you know, we're talking about columns here because beams are, beams are a different story. Um, I'm going to hold off on answering that because there is a topic that comes up later specifically about geometric imperfections and it would be better to sort of address that when we're talking about that later. So we will we will talk about that. Um, but in terms of the theory, uh, the idea is that you, if we're talking about ideal column behavior, you apply load, apply load, apply load, and then once buckling occurs, it is sudden. Okay, and so that's that's one of the the characteristics of stability theory is that buckling is a sudden phenomenon. If you're um, if you're talking about um, uh, uh, first order behavior, and we'll, we'll get to that in a bit. Ms. Romans asked, does columns run only vertically? That's a good question. Um, when we say column, and when I'm talking about column in terms of design, I'm really just talking about elements that are subjected to compression. Um, the two most common instances of that are columns in a building. So you know, like what's behind this, and that's, you know, running vertically. Another uh, uh, common uh, element that's in compression might be a brace or a truss element. You know, when you solve a truss, you get members in tension and members in compression, and those members in compression are going to sort of be treated as columns. There are, um, there is a, a, a nuance to that, which we'll talk about later, which is basically, um, 
uh, it, which is basically the, the, the effective length factor. We'll get to that in a bit. I think of columns like on a porch. Well, I mean, it's, I mean, you have column, are you talking about like the vertical columns that keep your awning up? Like the, yeah, I mean, it's the same thing. I mean, we have, you know, like for instance, back here, you know, there's a column that's holding up, you know, the tributary area of the, the floor that it's, uh, that it's responsible for. So it's, you know, kind of the same thing. Um, just the loads and the magnitude of what we deal with in steel design are far more what you would see in, you know, your, your residential uh, environment. Okay, uh, any other questions before we get back to the math? Okay, so um, if you sum moments uh, about where you cut the section, you're going to get the internal moment in the section, and then you're also going to get the moment that's generated from the load. Because where the beam, or the uh, here I am, I'm doing it again, where the, um, where the column is being deflected, there is a load acting at an eccentricity. It's some distance away from your section cut, and that distance away is the deflected shape, so we're calling that Y. So you can relate the moment in the column to that load and its deflected shape, and that's what you see in this um, in this expression here. Now, where the calculus comes from is this. Now, you should remember this from structural analysis. This is the moment curvature expression that the second derivative of deflection is m over ei. Anytime that you're uh, subjecting something to a bending moment, um, that you can relate that bending moment to the deflection with that second order uh, uh, differential equation. And so basically what I'm doing here is I'm replacing this with negative PY. The negative just comes from our sign convention. And so I can take that and turn it into this. And so ultimately what I come up with is a second order differential equation. So Y double prime or the second derivative plus this constant times Y equals zero. And this is something that you should be able to deal with if you took math 335. If, you, if I gave you y double prime plus 4y equals 0, you should be able to solve that. That's what you do in math 335 all the time. Now, what we're going to do to make the, the, symbol, the, the, the symbology a, a little bit better is we're going to take this uh, p over ei term and we're going to call it alpha squared. We call it alpha squared just to make the math a bit simpler later. Um, but it, we could call it anything, or we could not call it anything at all. We could just leave it as uh, uh, y double prime plus p over ei times y. But ultimately what I want is this. This is a second order linear differential equation with constant coefficients. That should be something that you could handle quite well. Now I'm smart enough to know that, um, well first off, everybody in here should remember how to solve this. Um, I know how um, most engineering students will want to solve it. So what is it? Right? Does this look familiar? You're like, no, we've never used this before. So here we go. This is y double prime plus, I just did a squared times y, right? And so what do we get? Uh, you know, C1 times cosine plus C2 times sine. Now, that's the, 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 uh, the engineering student way of doing it. I'm seeing the comment in the chat. But, I mean, you know, we could take that differential equation, turn it into an algebraic expression, a polynomial with constant coefficients, and then, you know, you solve it. You get imaginary roots. And so imaginary roots, you get the sine and cosine. Hopefully everybody remembers how to do that. Um, that does, I mean, again, this isn't a... Um, you know, I, I don't want this to be a, a, a math class. I just want to make sure that everybody sort of kind of follows along with, with what I'm doing here. So solving this differential equation, I get a uh, C1 times the cosine plus C2 times the sine. So um, that's my solution. Now, that what does that mean? I mean, we're engineers. I want to make that mean something. So let's talk about these constants. How do we solve for these constants? Anybody remember that term from differential equations? In order to solve for that C1 and C2, I need something. What do I need? Oh, you all know this. In order to solve for arbitrary constants in a differential equation, I need boundary conditions. 
I need boundary conditions in order to solve for those because they're arbitrary and I use the boundary condition, the, the constants are arbitrary. I use the boundary conditions to come up with a, uh, uh, a specific solution for the problem I'm looking at. So I've got C1 and C2. I need two boundary conditions that uh, are appropriate for the problem I'm dealing with. So this is a column, right? It's a column undergoing compression. And if you remember, I assumed that this was simply supported, right? Now this term y, what, what is that? that? That is the deflected shape, okay? So y would be the plot of this. Remember how I said it was sinusoidal? Well, that's why I said it was sinusoidal because the answer is in terms of sines and cosines. So this right here, that's y of x. That's the plot of, of that deflected shape. And so what I need are some boundary conditions in order to, to solve for those constants. What I know is that y equals zero right here and y equals zero right there. That Those are my boundary conditions. So the boundary conditions are y equals zero at the bottom and y equals zero at the top or at x equals zero or x equals L, the, the length of the column, okay? Everybody with me so far? Everybody's being quiet. I want to make sure y'all understand this. Okay, if it makes you feel better, we only break calculus out one more time this semester. Only one, once more. This is the first of two times, and after that we won't touch it anymore. So, okay. Now, so we solve for C1 and C2. <laughs> we solve for C1 and C2. Here's, here's what happens. So let's take the first boundary condition, which is Y of zero equals zero. So when I plug this in, I get zero equals C1 times the cosine of zero plus C2 times the sine of zero, right? Well, the sine of zero is zero and the cosine of zero is one. So C1 times one, I get that C1 equals zero, right? That's easy, right? So that takes this expression and instead of y equals C1 times a pile of junk plus C2 times a pile of junk, C1 is zero. So all that stuff goes away. Now let's take the second boundary condition. So here's my expression, y equals c2 times the sine of alpha x. And so plug in x equals l, plug in y equals zero, and I'm left with this. So that's just the same thing over here. So everything I'm writing over there on the right is just me repeating what's on the left. There's nothing new there. So I've got this equation here, and this one is a bit trickier to interpret because we could produce a, a variety of solutions that makes this equation true, but only one of them is really valuable, okay? So we have C2 times the sine of alpha L equals zero, okay? How could that term, or how could that equation be true mathematically, okay? Well, let's go to the, the, the math on that a bit. So let's, you know, so this is the equation I'm looking at, okay? How could that expression be true? Well, what about C2? If C2 equals zero, that, that would make that expression true, but that also wouldn't mean anything because if C2 equals zero and C1 equals zero, then there's no deflection. That would be indicative of the buckled column with no deflection. That wouldn't make any sense. So we call that a trivial solution. It doesn't really move us down the field any further. It just, it just just We just sort of stop. It's like we get constant one equals zero, constant two equals zero. That doesn't tell us anything, okay? What about the length equals zero? What if L equals zero? Well, look at the math. If L equals zero, yeah, that the equation would be true, but it doesn't mean anything because now we have a column that has no length. That doesn't make sense. Here's the column. It has some length to it. It's not L equals zero. So that doesn't make sense either. That's a trivial solution. What about alpha? What if alpha equals zero? Well, this is the term for alpha. Well, if alpha is zero, you know, you'd have a column with no applied load or some, or maybe you'd have an issue with stiffness. That doesn't make sense either. But what about this? What if the sine equals zero? Not the constants, not the terms, but the actual sine function itself. Maybe that solution isn't so trivial. Now let's go back to trig. If I graph the sine function, what does it look like? It looks like that, right? When does the sine equal zero? It equals zero here and here. 
and here, and here, and here. You know, the sine function goes on forever. So when does the sine function equal zero? It equals zero at integer multiples of pi, right? So I can take that alpha L term and say, okay, that inside of that sine function has got to be, you know, some integer multiple of pi. So I can solve and get, okay, this is a term for alpha. I've got this term here that I had for alpha. Set those two equal to one another. Solve for the load. Now, I'm going to take a sec before we move on from here and see how we can interpret this. But is everybody sort of with me so far? I'm just using the graph of the sine function to figure out where the inside of that expression, uh, uh, what the inside of that expression needs to be in order to satisfy the conditions, setting it equal to my previous term for alpha and, and solving. Somebody's microphone turned on. Yes, sir. Well, that's coming next. That, that's coming next. And, and it's going to come from just looking at the math and looking at, at it really from a common sense standpoint. That, that, but that'll make sense here. It's a very good question. Everybody with me so far? Now, what does that N term mean and what's the right value to use? Well, here's what that N term means. The effective N generates what are called different mode shapes. So what I have here are a, a series of images, and I only did three of them, right? Uh, just to kind of show you what happens when you use various um, values for n. First off, you know, it, I, oh, I have it here on this slide. First off, n is squared. So it doesn't matter whether n is positive or negative, right? That, that, that doesn't mean anything. And if n equals zero, well, that doesn't really mean much at all because that would just mean a load that the p is zero. So that doesn't mean anything either. So we start at n equals one and we just start increasing, okay? So what I've got here is the plot of what the column would look like when it's buckled if n equals one, if n equals two, if n equals three, and then if n equals one, n equals two, n equals, equals three, what are the buckled loads? So if n equals 1, the column is going to look like what's over here on the left, and the buckling load is pi squared ei over l squared. And so that pretty much reflects what's going on with reality, right? If I take my column in my hand and load it in compression, it does what the column is doing here on, on n equals 1. If I, um, if I look at, let's say, you know, n equals 2, well first off, you know, in order to generate that shape, I have to use a higher buckling load, but that wouldn't make sense anyways. I mean, if I, if I take this column and I start increasing the load, I'm going to hit this value before I hit this one. That second one is four times the other one, right? Because it's pi squared ei over l squared versus four pi squared ei over l squared. See, ultimately what we're trying to figure out is the worst case scenario for the column. And the worst case scenario for the column is when is it going to buckle? And it's going to buckle when it hits this load. That's the lowest load that it can carry before it buckles. Make sense? And what we call that is um, what we saw these buckled shapes. This is what's called a mode shape. So um, mode shapes show up a lot in advanced uh, analysis. So uh, for any of you working on any abacus stuff, you run an eigenvalue analysis and it'll spit out the mode shapes and from each of those mode shapes you can, uh, you can figure out what your buckling load is if the structure gets really, really complicated. So I know some of you might be working on some abacus stuff later uh, for some research projects. So factoid for later. Um, any questions about this? So you know, uh, uh, Ms. Rack said, uh, how do I figure out which n value to use? It's it, for this particular problem, it's this right here. All right, so basically we've got it figured out. We know what the load is. It's pi squared EI over L squared, just using N equals one. And if we wanna know what the stress is, it's just P over A. We just take the load and divide it by A. What we do when we express the buckling stress though, is we rewrite it a little bit. What we do is, so if you're taking this term right here and you're dividing it by A, 
So it's pi squared e i over l squared times a. This term i over a, if I take the square root of i over a, that's the radius of gyration. That's that r term. Remember in tension members when we looked at l over r, we looked at slenderness. So we write, we write it in that L over R format so that we can use slenderness. Slenderness is a really convenient term to use when you're looking at buckling because it's unitless. You have the length divided by the radius of gyration and it has no unit. So very commonly in stability land, we look at things in terms of slenderness. So, um, so not only do we have the buckling load, but we have the buckling stress. And that's the end of the calculus. We're done, no more calculus. Um, any questions before we talk about why this doesn't, why it's not enough, I think is the best way of putting it. It's a very useful expression, it's just not enough. All right, let's talk about why it's not enough. One of the first things that we need to do right off the bat is we need to address a, an elephant in the room with our derivation. Uh, in the derivation, we assumed that the column was simply supported, that it was pinned on the top and pinned on the bottom. Ooh, I've got a formatting issue. I didn't subscript that or subscript that. I'll fix that later. So we need to, uh, uh, we need to look at, well, what happens if the the, the column experiences different boundary conditions. So for instance, you know, right now I've got, you know, a pinned, pinned col or pen pen column. What if it's fixed free? Or what if it's fixed pinned? You know, how does that affect the capacity? Well, does it affect the capacity? Yeah, it affects the capacity all right. Um, but instead of trying to re-derive a differential equation from scratch, because, I mean, short answer is we do this in the background to come up with these k values, but instead of trying to have to come up with different solutions, what we try and do is we try and use the same solution we came up with before, but we try and tweak it a bit. And the way that we tweak it is we, we, uh, we make sure that the length that we're using is indicative of the, um, uh, uh, of the original solution. So we handle this by computing an effective length for the column. So we adjust the length with these k values. Let me kind of show you what we're talking about here. So I've got these two columns. The one on the left is the one we just looked at, a fixed or a pin-pin column. And then the one on the right is a new one, right? So how would we use, how would we handle the new one, okay? Well, let's take a look at what these columns would look like when they're buckled, okay? So if I look at the one on the left here, let me pull up my webcam so you all can it, it, look at my, you can click my webcam there and kind of see this. So the first one on the left is pin pin. So that would look kind of like this. Whereas the one on the right is fixed free. So it's gonna be clamped on the bottom and free on the top. So it's probably kind of gonna kind of buckle a little differently. Like the top is going to translate over a bit, but the bottom isn't gonna move at all. Um, fortunately, my, my slides draw that a lot better than I can, um, you, know, in, in, you know, with my hands or even with this, this prop. If I look at the buckled shape for a pen to pen column, it looks like, you know, what it did before. If I looked at the fixed free column, it kind of looks like this. So what we do for columns of different boundary conditions is we say, okay, what does the length need to be so that the buckled shape matches the original solution. So if I look at the fixed free column, that effective length is twice what the length is for the pen pen case. So what we do is we adjust the length using this k value. So instead of, you know, uh, Fe is pi squared E over, you know, L over R squared, which is what we had before, what we do is we adjust it and we use K L over R squared. And K is just a constant to try and map this length to this one. So for the, the standard case, K is one. But for any different case, K is either gonna be higher than one or lower than one, such that that buckled shape matches the, the pen pen column. So if I look at this fixed free situation, 
k is 2. Okay, So that would be the k value for a fixed free column. And so you can see here I've just got a different expression for fe and ke. And that's actually, or, uh, fe and, and, and pe. That's actually a really easy thing to handle. We just introduce an effective length factor. And the nice thing about the code is the code provides these for us in a really easy uh, uh, resource. Now, this is actually in the back of the manual in the commentary. It's, it's way back in the, 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 gray, the, the gray line pages. So if you remember in your, uh, in your manual, there's the code and the commentary. Remember, like this is the code and then the gray section, that's the commentary. If you go way back in the gray pages, this is on 16.1-570. Uh, in the table looks like this. These are uh, K values for various different boundary conditions. And um, the thing to pay attention to is if you look on the bottom of the table, there are two rows. There is the, the top row, it says theoretical K value. So you can look here. This is the one that we were just looking at. This is the fixed free, and you can see K is two. But then you can see recommended design value when ideal conditions are approximated. We're going to use this. So. The theoretical value is two, but we adjust it a little bit for the real world. See, when we use terms like pin pinned and fixed fixed, like let's say a, a fixed boundary condition. A fixed boundary condition assumes that that boundary condition is infinitely stiff, that it will not translate and it will not rotate. Nothing in this world is infinitely stiff. Like that, that doesn't work that way. Everything is going to experience a little bit of, every boundary condition is going to experience a little bit of translation or a little bit of rotation. So we change those values a little bit to account for the real world. So don't use the two, we would use 2.1. Um, so for instance, if you have a column that is fixed on the top and the bottom, theoretically the K value should be 0.5. Ooh, I, I colored over it there. Um, so theoretically the K value is 0.5, but uh, we're gonna use 0.65 for, you know, to, to account for real world conditions. Again, the theoretical values are just that, theoretical. Um, any questions on that? And again, if you're having trouble finding that, again, it's, it's in the back part of the manual, again, in the gray pages, near the rear part of the, the, gray, uh, the gray line pages section. I'm gonna give everybody a sec because we we talked about a lot of theory here, and I want to make sure I'm not I'm not dumping a lot on you. Okay. Now, up until now, we're still talking about ideal behavior. I mean, we're talking about boundary conditions and 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 uh, our differential equation. I mean, everything up until now has been using our differential equation solution, you know, the pi squared e over L over R squared. I mean, we might adjust it for different boundary conditions, but it's still assuming ideal behavior. There is a difference between ideal behavior or this theoretical assumed behavior of a column versus what's going on in the real world. Uh, and in the real world, there are two really big reasons why column behavior deviates from the theory, okay? The first is what's called residual stresses. So let me explain what residual stresses are. Um, let's say, for example, that we have a, uh, a, a section of steel, and let's say it's round bar, just a round, you know, uh, solid round bar. Um, when we produce that steel, you know, we've got this, you know, molten hot steel that we form into a round bar. And then once that forming has been completed, the round bar cools. Now, if the bar is round, um, it's going to cool from the outside in, and you're going to result in a pretty even cool distribution, like a, a pretty even distribution of that cooling. Like it's going to start at the outside, work its way in. Um, we're not talking about round bar here though, we're talking about something like an I-beam. Okay, so you've got this molten steel that you form into a, a, a billet, a near net shape, uh, and then you pass it through these you know, high pressure rollers to sequentially form it into the I shape that we're gonna use in a, a column or a beam, like a W10 by 49, whatever. Um, it's still pretty hot, okay? And so it starts to cool, okay? 
think about the physics of this. How is it going to cool? Well, if I look at this, you know, eye section, I'm guessing that the, the tips, the parts that are sticking out here, they're the ones that are going to cool first. And then maybe the center of the web cools next. The part that's going to cool last is this, this what, what I'm calling the flange web junction, that, that, you know, thick material between where the flange and web um, uh, uh, joins, all right? That's going to cool last. Well, you've got different elements cooling at different rates. What happens is you start to lock in some stresses, like the, the shorter, or the, the, the tips and the exposed regions, they cool first and they start to lock compression inside them. Then when the other parts cool, they have to lock tension inside them so that it can reach equilibrium. Like you can't have a, a column where some of it's experiencing compression and some of it's experiencing tension and those two forces don't cancel each other out. If they didn't cancel each other out, the column would be running away from you. So they have to, they have to balance each other out, but there is compression and tension locked into the section. Okay. Now you can get residual stresses from other things. I mean, the, the general definition of a residual stress is any stress that's locked into a product from the manufacturing process. So you can get it from welding, you can get it from cold bending, from cambering, you can get residual stresses and strains locked into a section from, from that manufacturing process. See, we never really worried about that for tension members because we assume for gross section yielding and net section fracture, we blow through all that. But we're not talking about, you know, uh, yielding a fracture of tension members. We're talking about compression members. And the issue with a compression member is that it presents an instability problem, that it wants to buckle. And so that's a big deal. If you look at the stress strain curve for, a, uh, uh, for a, uh, 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 an element, you look, well, what does it look like if you don't consider residual stresses? And what does it look like if you do consider residual stresses? You get a pretty different, you know, set of behavior. Like for no residual stresses, you basically assume that that steel is just going to have a linear stress strain relationship up, up until it hits FY and then it starts to yield. But if you consider those residual stresses, that curve starts to change. You get less stiffness as that load starts getting higher. And that loss of stiffness is going to result in a loss of capacity. You're not going to be able to account for that Euler elastic buckling capacity because this is what's going on in real life. The theory can't handle that, okay? So we have to account for this in the real world, okay? That is one of the first major reasons why real column behavior deviates from ideal column behavior. The other reason is imperfections, okay? The column that we looked at, and this kind of goes to Mr. Adkins' question that he uh, that he mentioned earlier about, you know, over time and whatnot. The time issue really isn't the, the deal, but the geometry is. So um, when we did the derivation of the, um, the column, we assumed that that column was perfectly straight and it was perfectly plumb. No column in existence is perfectly straight and perfectly plumb all columns possess some degree of geometric imperfections. For example, um, when you construct a steel frame structure, um, you have tolerances that you have to meet. So one of the column tolerances is that your column can't be out of plumb more than H over 500. So the height of the column over 500. Now that's not very much. I mean, let's see for a 12 foot column, that's like a quarter of an inch. Let's see, 12 by 12 divided by... Yeah, that's like a little over a quarter of, of an inch in 12 feet. That's not very much, but can it affect the capacity? Oh, you bet. Absolutely. My window. Oh, there we go. Sorry, my, my window went blank there for a second. All columns possess some degree of imperfection. They might be, so here's the column. Let me turn my webcam on so you can kind of see this. So the column, there, there are two types of imperfections that we have to deal with in like, you know, refined analysis. The column might be out of plumb a little bit, or it might have some initial out of straightness. Now, not much. I mean, I'm, I'm exaggerating it here, but that initial out of straightness and that initial uh, out of plumbness can really affect the, the capacity in the end. See, um, what we find when we um, when we look at uh, real behavior versus uh, uh, this you know theoretical behavior is uh, 
When you look at the math, the differential equation that we just derived, the way that differential equation works is it uses what's called a, a bifurcation approach. The column is fine, it's fine, it's fine, and then when it reaches that magical load, that pi squared EI over L squared, it suddenly deflects laterally in an, in an uncontrolled fashion because the math basically says that column's done. But if that column possesses a little bit of a, um, uh, uh, an initial out of straightness or, or out of plumbness, it's not going to behave like that. It's going to deflect a, a little bit more gradually, but as that load increases, the deflection is going to get worse and worse. And it's going to be unable to reach the full buckling capacity because of that initial imperfection. And it always exists. There's always an initial out of straightness or an initial out of plumbness or, or, or both. So th th that is going to be present and we have to account for that in the real world. So those are the two really big reasons why real column behavior deviates from ideal column behavior. Any questions on that before we talk about how the manual handles real column capacity? All right, so let's talk about this. So let's get into the, the, the real world. How do you handle this stuff? Like if you have this nice differential equation, but it's not quite up to par, it doesn't have enough, um, it, does, it doesn't have the robustness necessary to handle the, um, the geometric imperfections and the residual stresses. How do we design columns? How do we go about developing an expression that we can use? Well, it goes to going down to the lab and, and getting you know, five, 600 columns down there and failing them and plotting the data and seeing if we can fit an expression that fits the test data uh, as closely as possible. And so that's what we use. And it's not just that, I mean, there's different expressions for different, you know, we use the AISC expression, there's Eurocode expression, Canadian expression, so on and so forth. They all tend to fall along that same process. They're based in, in the theory um, and use uh, some of the terms like FE in, uh, and whatnot in order to, um, to develop a model, but they're, they're based off of real world test data. So what does the AISC column capacity look like? Well, first thing we ought to do is we ought to open up the spec, okay? And so we're gonna go to chapter E. So if we, chapter E is right in front of chapter D. Chapter D is the chapter on tension members. I want everybody to do this with me. I want you to open to 16.1-33. This is the start of chapter E, and there's a, a, a lot of good stuff in here. I'm gonna give you all a second on that. It should be right near the, the, um, the table for shear lag factors. Like I'm looking at the table for shear lag factors. I turn the page and there's chapter E starting. It's right there. Um, chapter E, the title of that chapter is Design of Members for Compression, so columns, that's what we're talking about here. Uh, and there's a series of sections like E1, E2, E3, E4, da, 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 da. We're gonna be focusing on E1, E2, and E3, which by the way, um, one of the things that I, I didn't quite um, emphasize at the beginning, but I think I should emphasize from here on out. Um, up until now, we've been using a variety of different rolled shapes. We've been using like angles and, and channels and WTs and all that. From here on out, W shapes, nothing else because columns and beams and buildings are W shapes. So from here on out, no, we're not gonna be using anything else. So that, that's gonna be the name of the game moving forward. Okay, so let's just dig through the spec a little bit. Um, E1 is general provisions, and the only thing we really care about there is the fee value. So fee is 0.9 for columns. So don't have to worry about uh, uh, trying to figure that out. That's right there. Now, when you turn the page, does everybody see the gray uh, user note? It's like a big old table. I don't have it here on the slide, but it says selection table for the application of chapter E sections. Does everybody see that? I want to make sure everybody sees that. Okay, so what you see in this table is a series of cross sections. So there's like I shapes, there's tubes, there's T shapes, there's angles, there's all sorts of different shapes. And if you look on the right uh, next to each shape, there's basically two categories, whether or not the section has slender elements or whether it doesn't. 
Okay, we'll talk about slender elements at the very, very, very end uh, just to kind of give you an idea. But we're going to be talking primarily about sections without slender elements. Basically, what that's talking about is how thin the flanges are and how thin the, uh, the, the, the web is. If you remember very uh, early on in the semester, somebody asked about when you go into the manual, um, there's the shapes and they have those little footnotes like the C or, or whatnot or the F in table 1-1. That's what it's talking about as to whether or not you have slender elements or not. And most of the columns that we analyze and design are not going to have slender elements uh, in building design. So we're not going to worry about that until near the end. I'll, I'll sort of uh, show you what that means. So if you're in I shapes, you're in either section E3 or E4. And the only reason you'd ever be in E4 is that the section isn't symmetric. So we're only going to be dealing with E3. So section E2 just says what the effective length is. That's just K times L, which we knew that. And then we got this, this uh, mess here in section E3, and it looks kind of nasty. It's really not. Your homework is sort of focused on making sure that you understand what's going on here, but I'm going to help you digest it uh, a little bit. So um, what we have here is that the capacity of a section is defined by taking the gross area AG and multiplying it by F critical, the F, dot, uh, F sub CR. Instead of just a formula, there's actually a range for F critical. This is what it looks like if you actually plot F critical. F critical actually has two different expressions and it's a function of your slenderness. If you have a column that's really, really slender, that has a really high L over R value, then the, um, then the column is gonna experience buckling in an elastic mode. So if you have a really high L over R or KL over R, then your critical buckling stress is going to be this. It's going to be basically your elastic stress just reduced a little bit. Why do we reduce it a little bit? What's the deal with that 0.877? That's the geometric imperfections uh, uh, playing, uh, playing a role. If you have a, a somewhat stockier column or a shorter column or one that's less slender, you're going to be governed more by inelastic buckling, which is really where the residual stresses start to, uh, to take into a, a effect. And the way that you compute that critical buckling stress is you take 0.658 and you raise it to the Fy over Fe, okay? So that expression there where it says Fy over Fe, you're not multiplying it by that fraction, you're computing that fraction and then you're raising it to that power. Uh, and then you take that big old expression and you multiply it by Fy. And if you plot that, it looks like this. So you get sort of this sort of S curve looking shape here. Um, this is the, the theoretical buckling, that's just Fe, and I just have it cut off at the yield stress so that the curve just doesn't go on forever. But that's what the, the critical buckling stress curve looks like. Here's what the equations look like. Um, this is just in the spec, I'm just rewriting it. So the, if you want to determine F critical for a column, the first thing you have to do is you have to compute Fe. Uh, Fe is just pi squared E divided by KL over R squared. E is the modulus of elasticity, the Young's modulus for steel. That is 29,000 KSI. I want that number burned into the back of your memory by the time that you get out of here. And once you get FE, you compute F critical. And F critical is either in any elastic buckling range or the elastic buckling range, depending upon whether uh, you know whether or not your uh, what your KL over R is. And if you're wondering what this is, this 4.71 square root of E over FY, if you take that set it equal to that, and solve for the slenderness, you get 4.71 squared of E over FY. It's just setting those two equal to one another to find out where they intersect. It, it's, it's really not uh, anything special. So this slide is probably like the most important slide for your homework assignment because what I want you to do is I want you to take this math and I want you to plot this in Excel. Uh, I want you to take this curve and I want you to generate that plot, okay? So if you look at your homework assignment, let me stop my share here and pull up the homework assignment. So this is your homework assignment. I want you to create a, a, a spreadsheet that will plot that that plot I just showed, that KL over R versus F critical, okay? 
And, and in order to do that, you need a yield stress. So we're just going to use 42 KSI. I just made up a value. It doesn't really matter. You just need one that's realistic. So KL over R is going to be on the x-axis. And on the y-axis, you're going to have F critical. And I want you to plot from 0 to 200 in 5 foot increments. So like your x-axis is going to go 0, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, all the way to 200. Um, make sure that your plot contains labels on the axis and uh, a title where appropriate. And I've given you a couple hints to make the Excel a little easier for you. So first off, uh, when you prepare your Excel table, you should probably have three columns of values, a column for your KL over R's, a column for your FE's. Do those separately, then do the F criticals. It'll be easier if you do the FE's uh, on their own. Um, when you're doing the math, you're going to find that it's pretty easy to compute all the values, but at, K, at the first row, you're going to get like a divide by zero error on FE because uh, FE is going to be, it's going to go to infinity uh, at, K, at KL over R is zero, and your F critical is just going to be 42. It's just going to be uh, FY. Don't use a fee value. I just want the, the, the raw stress. Um, and if you want to use the if formula in itself, uh, it can make your life uh, a lot easier. Um, and if you do it correctly, it should look like the plot here on this slide. Like if I stop this. If you do it correctly, it should look like, like this. Like particularly it should look like, like that. And so what I want you to submit is an Excel spreadsheet with that, uh, those formulas, that calculation, and I want to see that plot. That's what I want to see. What we're going to do is once you um, once you have a, um, a, a once you feel comfortable with that, we're going to start analyzing some columns and then designing some columns uh, later this week. Or designing will probably start next week. Any questions? Nobody expected an Excel spreadsheet, did you? It's not bad. This is actually a really short assignment. It's not hard. So it's, well, you could do MATLAB if you want. So, all right, everybody. Um, that's all I've got. I will, <laughs> I will see you all, uh, on uh, Friday and we'll start, um, we will start um, uh, doing some column analysis on Friday. Take it one step at a time, though. That's all I got. I will see you.